We're live. We're on History Lens on Think Tech Hawaii. My name is John David Ann, professor of history at HPU, and I've got Dr. Brian Gibson with me today once again to talk about U.S.-Iranian relations. And we've had two of these conversations which have been well received and, and very interesting and really kind of uh, sketching out the the history of the relationship, you know, the reasons why the United States and Iran are at loggerheads today. Uh, but then you have this very interesting moment a few years back when the United States and Iran were actually working together and uh, actually signed a you know, nuclear treaty. It was unpopular among Republicans in the United States. But Brian, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me back, John. I really appreciate it. Yeah, great. Great to have you on. So uh, so we, we kind of ended the last show talking about the Obama administration and its kind of hardline approach at the beginning of its relationship with Iran and then a softening approach. Let's let's start there. And can you tell us how and why this happened? Well, the I mean, this is this is a very complicated issue uh, with a lot of history and we've gotten into a lot of it so far. But where we kind of last left off was the U.S. led invasion of Iraq okay. and uh, how at this particular juncture in history, you started to see a little bit of cooperation between the Iranians and the Americans. Um, I believe I talked about Afghanistan and how the Americans and the Iranians worked together to overthrow the Afghan or the Taliban regime. Uh, and then implement a democratic institution there. Uh, so when we're looking at this particular uh, situation, when the U.S. invaded Iraq and handed uh, the country over to the Shia, which are co-religionists with Iranians who are Shia, um, you get this really curious situation where the Iranians become quite spooked. Now, the Iranians have had a nuclear program that goes back to the 1970s, uh, in which uh, the Nixon administration, actually, it even goes back in the 1950s with the Adams for Peace program under oh, Eisenhower, sure, sure. but it really starts to amplify uh, in the 1970s uh, under the Shah, which was, of course, an American ally. And so when an American ally is, you know, right. quietly pursuing weapons, the United States doesn't care. Right. But sure. when, well, like in the case of Israel, for example, which is uh, an unofficial but Right. Definitely nuclear Clearly state. Clearly they have nuclear weapons, yeah. They definitely have nuclear weapons. Uh, <laughs> so what's really interesting about this situation with Iran is the United States kind of turns a blind eye until the revolution happens. And the revolution changes everything because now this uh, very radical regime is potentially in possession of nuclear materials and in possession of uh, at least this, the foundation for what could be a nuclear weapons program. Um, now, one thing that I should really distinguish off the bat, which most people don't quite do, is that the, a nuclear weapons program is one thing. A nuclear enrichment program is a different thing. Right, of course, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, under is... the NPT, the, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, which deals very specifically with nuclear technology, uh, countries are allowed to have nuclear programs. Uh, for example, I grew up in Canada, and just down the street from my house is a nuclear reactor that creates medical isotopes. Right, um, right. You need medical isotopes in order to treat cancer. It's yeah. essential. Uh, yeah. That's what chemotherapy is, right? Yeah. Um, so countries have a right to do this type of uh, enrichment, but when you start getting into the much bigger picture of uh, enrichment where you're trying to seek nuclear weapons, yeah. That's a different story. Mm -hmm. um, so in the case of Iran during the 1980s, it didn't really deal with its nuclear program very much. Uh, and even into the, the 1990s, it was kind of nascent. It, it wasn't uh, a, a major part of its strategy as it has since become. Okay. So then when you're looking at the early 2000s, when, uh, when you start to see the, when you see the invasion of Iraq, and the Iranians see how easily the Iraqis are destroyed by the American military. Oh. Uh, the Iranians are quite concerned because at this point, they, the U.S. has taken out the Taliban and is occupying Afghanistan right, right. Uh, and uh, to its one big, corner. And yeah, then on the other side, yeah. Iraq, 
Right, has now, a big role now in the in the Middle East as uh, you know major, occupation major forces. Role. It's, it's not just Saudi Arabia anymore, mm-hmm. right? It's not just bases in the Middle East. It's actually occupying forces. Yeah, I can see that. Well, and it's flanked Iran on both sides. Right. So the U.S. could ostensibly invade Iran from Afghanistan and from Iraq yeah. uh, with ground forces, and so this really concerned the regime. Now, what's important at this particular juncture is that. Uh, the Iranians then turned to the American government and said, uh, let's let's cut a deal. It's known as the grand bargain. Okay. And essentially, they said, we are willing to sit down and negotiate anything with you, hmm. including our nuclear program. And the Bush administration at this point was very confident in itself. Uh, they had just taken out the Iraqis very easily. And uh, they were, you know, um, very, very excited and very full of hubris. And hardliners in the administration like dick cheney said we don't talk to terrorists yeah now remember right, the u.s right. is the cia and the state department <laughs> are actively engaged in diplomacy right. with the iranians at this point over afghanistan yeah. and of course the iranians were happy to see saddam hussein go and the implementation of democracy in iraq because right. democracy is the tyranny of the majority and the majority right. happened to be the same religion as the Iranians, right, at least the same right, sect. Right, right. So the U.S. handed Iraq to Iran on a platter, and Iran didn't have to do anything about it. Right, right. Yeah, we were talking about this last time where uh, yes, it actually would, would have been in the U.S. interest to actually align itself more closely with Iran at this point, but it really did Iran's mm-hmm. bidding by, by uh, taking Indeed. out Saddam. And, uh, and it's politics here, right? You're talking about politics trumping a good kind of uh, strategic diplomacy. Exactly. Nothing new so in that, when, I guess. No, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then so in 2005, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad comes to power. Because uh, basically what the regime had concluded and what the people had concluded is that working with the United States just isn't ever going to go anywhere. Um, whatever efforts Iran has made in good faith towards the United States, as we talked about in previous classes, not classes, sorry, I'm so used to teaching, uh, in previous uh, episodes, um, the U.S. didn't really reciprocate. Yeah. And this it, this is one of those instances. Now, the Europeans continue to negotiate with the Iranians okay. uh, throughout the background of all of this. Um, but when you get to the uh, coming to power of Ahmadinejad, Ahmadinejad is uh, a different cat. He is a much, much more uh, belligerent, much more uh, vocal. He did the whole thing about denying the Holocaust and held a bunch of conferences uh, to that effect and was just a very belligerent individual, which worked to Iran's advantage to a certain degree because mm-hmm. it spooked everyone and it allowed Iran to, ex- uh, to essentially show that it's strong. And that it won't be cowed by right, right. Uh, external powers, yeah. which is a very, very important part of Iran's psyche. Um, the psychology of the state is uh, a steadfast determination to not be dominated by anyone other than themselves. Right. Um, so, and this is a part of the big push behind its nuclear program is that it doesn't want to be reliant on the so uh, sorry the Russians or the Americans or the British or the French it wants to be reliant on the Iranians yeah. and if it can maximize its sale of oil while diverting uh, uh, energy production because most of its energy production has come from the burning of fossil fuels if it can then develop a nuclear energy program for example then that's more that can be sold on the international market and less for domestic consumption right of course that's yeah, at least yeah part sure. of their sure. their strategy yeah, yeah um, makes sense. It, it creates less reliance on other places right uh so under Ahmadinejad, you start to see a lot more concern and at this point uh they really the iranians really ramp up their nuclear enrichment program now i should point out that the cia in 2007 concluded that iran had uh dismantled its nuclear weapons program capital w Okay. weapons okay uh they had dismantled it uh permanently and they concluded this the israeli Mossad has subsequently confirmed this conclusion uh 
there's been no point since then that has uh, there, where there's been a suggestion by any official, real, true official intelligence channels that have suggested that the Iranians have resumed a nuclear weapons program. Okay, you're talking about enrichment. E even, even as of today, you're talking about. Yes. Okay. They, they have not gone well, for a bomb. Okay. They were going for one up until two. Why are we here? <laughs> we're yeah, talking and then about they right. The development of yeah, Iranian nu nuclear point. weapons, and apparently they're not yet developing nuclear weapons in Iran. See, now this is the key point, is that you see constantly in the rhetoric of people who are opposed to Iran, uh, like like Trump, where they just say weapons in, in right. place of enrichment. Right. And those who are much more practical and who are, have studied the situation be like, no, it's enrichment, it's not weapons. Yeah. yeah, okay. And the CIA are like, no, they're not going for weapons. <laughs> okay. Keep coming to this okay. conclusion and you keep saying weapons, but it's enrichment. But it's interesting, Iran, is, Iran today actually is using this idea that they might build a weapon uh, to to yeah. as negotiating leverage now to try to get the deal back, right? I mean, they're you know they're. I doubt that they would go for a weapon, because the thing is, to build a weapon, you need a lot of uranium. Right. Because uh, right. it's uh, think of it this way: um, if you're here's an analogy that I often use with my students. If you're starting with uh, like near beer, like the 0.1 percent alcohol beer. <laughs> And you need to turn that into 100% alcohol. You need to <laughs> distill out all of the water and you would need tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of this yeah. in order to create 1.5% beer. Sorry, 5% sure, sure, sure. beer. We're going nuclear now, imagine, weapons to near beer. An interesting show. <laughs> <laughs> but but that's, that's, it's a good analogy because then okay. if you want to get it to uh, from 5%, to uh, 10%, then you need a lot of 5% beer combined right. together yeah, and again, it. distilled down to so the point where So they just have to enri enrich a lot more material than they, they have available right now. So yeah, understood. Now, the high that the Iranians got was 20% yeah. uh, enriched uh, uranium. To get a nuclear bomb, you need 90. Okay. Yeah. Now the yeah. distillation process, uh, essentially right. using that analogy, uh, is the same. So right. once you know how to uh, distill that near beer into a 1% beer, you can just keep doing it, but you have to do a lot of it in order to get yeah. that enough yeah. for one bomb. Right. But I guess now, my, my point was that the yeah. Iranians have actually, so they've been accused of, of you know, they're, they're ready to make uh, nuclear weapons, right? They're using that perception in the mm -hmm. West, right? They're using that yeah. perception to try to create uh, leverage, nervousness in the West among those who want to, you know, who, who actually like the deal and want to get back the deal. They're trying to use this yeah. so they can get some leverage. So it's anyway, it's an interesting approach by Iran. I think it's a smart mm -hmm. approach because they're actually using the negative rhetoric against the West. Yeah. So this is called strategic ambiguity. Now, this uh, is what yeah. Saddam did about okay. his WMD programs. Right, right, was right. Because, you know, he had fought that war with Iran that was quite brutal. And if he had said to the West, you know, I'm, I actually don't have any of these weapons that I use to keep my country safe from Iran. The Iranians could then be like, oh, really? Yeah. You don't have those weapons anymore. Yeah, right, right, right. And then right, sure. they could attack. Okay, okay so, so Brian, we, we, yeah, we need, to, sorry, we, need to, we need to take a break right now and we'll come back and we'll talk about the, the treaty itself and, and yep. prospects for it. Okay, great. Yeah. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, the host of Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Hawaii Together deals with the problems we face in paradise and looks for solutions, whether it's with the economy, the government, or society. We're streamed live on Think Tech bi-weekly at 2 p.m. on Mondays. I want to thank you so much for watching. We look forward to seeing you. Again, I'm Kili'i Akina. Aloha.
We're back. We're live. We're on History Lens, and we have Brian Gibson with us, Dr. Brian Gibson from Hawaii Pacific University. And, and we're talking about the Iran, the U.S.-Iran nuclear deal. And uh, Brian has been talking about how this thing came to be. Brian, let's go back and let's talk a little bit more about actually the, how the deal came to be. Yeah, okay. Just one point that I just want to tie off yeah. is that for the Iranians to produce a nuclear weapon, they can't just produce one uh, because right. for right. to become a nuclear state, you need to test that to make sure right. it works. Right, of course. So they would need a, a minimum two bombs, which means double the amount of enrichment in order to get to that right. point. Right. Now, uh, so turning just to this, uh, how this deal came about, a lot of it was uh, driven by Iranian belligerents initially, where they were really ramping up their enrichment process and learning how to, to master the fuel cycle. Now, this is important. This is learning how to distill beer, right? And in Very order to, to figure this out, um, they, you know, there's a lot of trial and error and, and they're going from one point to the next and some things might not work very well and, and they're, they're going through the, the learning process. Now, the problem with once you learn how to do it, you have that knowledge. Yeah. And this is what's known as a breakout. Um, okay, uh, sure. So, yeah. so once the Iranians have figured out how to make, uh, how to master enrichment and do it quite efficiently and become more and more efficient over time, uh, that's how we determine the breakout period for a nuclear weapon. So at the height of Iran's enrichment, despite all the sanctions, despite um, the Israelis tried to assassinate a lot of its scientists uh, yeah. using uh, really kind of intense uh, methods, very uh, James Bondish, where they would oh, take magnet bombs that. and stick them on the side of cars. Okay, magnet then, bombs. Uh, while riding oh. on a motorcycle and then okay. explode the bomb. Oh, like whoa. some pretty badass stuff, all, okay. in all fairness. Okay. Uh, the, the type of stuff that you see in, in espionage movies. Yeah. Um, while the United States was ramping up its sanctions, um, right. 2009 with the election right then was uh, where uh, Ahmadinejad came to power uh, fraudulently for a second uh, term. Uh, that was kind of a turning point because the Obama administration had come into office and the Obama administration was much more interested in engaging in the Iranians diplomatically. Yeah, it makes sense. Now, right. The Bush administration was doing this to a certain degree. There was a channel that was opened up in Oman. Uh, this was a secret back channel where American officials went to Oman, Iranian officials went to Oman, and they met oh, okay. uh, on, uh, in secret. At first, uh, the leader of Oman was kind of talking to the one and then going to the other and then telling them. So there wasn't like face-to-face -face meetings, right. but those did eventually emerge um, later on. And that set the basis for like early negotiations that would lead to this Iran nuclear deal. Okay, that's now, interesting. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, yeah. the Obama administration was ratcheting up sanctions against the Iranians uh, quite extensively. Okay. Uh, these, uh, essentially what the Obama administration's strategy was, was to cut the Iranians off of the global banking system. Okay. Uh, and, huh. and while simultaneously convincing allies like the uh, South Koreans, uh, or the Japanese, to no longer purchase Iranian oil. Uh, and these are major consumers of Iranian oil. Okay, yeah, uh, that's an issue. Yeah. And so the U.S. would say, we will provide you with oil through uh, Saudi Arabia or for, from ourselves or our yeah. own stocks. Mm. And so they were basically trying to cut the Iranians off and hurt them economically. Now, so, they tighten so, the screw. Yes. So just a question. So this is the Obama administration, and they wanted engagement, yes. but they were using, I guess, pressure tactics to bring the Iranians around. Is that is that what's exactly. going on? Okay. Yeah. So so they're they're doing both. They're quietly negotiating with them in Oman, yeah. while ratcheting up the pressure on them okay. uh, diplomatically and economically through these sanctions. Okay. And the thing is, is that the Americans were able to get the Russians and the Chinese and the British and the French all on board for these sanctions. Cause you know, if one of them doesn't agree to it, uh, then their uh, sanctions won't pass in the UN right. security council. Right, right. So these groups were concerned enough about what Iran was doing to warrant the passage of these sanctions. And this okay. is very significant. Okay. And the Obama administration did an excellent job at bringing this all together. Now, uh, what you see in the aftermath of the 2009 election where, you know, a bunch of uh, pro-democracy, uh, 
protesters uh, essentially challenged the legitimacy of the regime. Uh, but this reinvigorated America's interest in becoming involved in these negotiations on a much bigger level. And so what this led to was what was known as the P5 plus one, okay. which is the permanent, uh, the five permanent members of the Security Council plus Germany. Now, I mentioned earlier that the Europeans had been engaged in talks with the Iranians all through the 2000s. Well, that's where the Germans come into this. They had been engaged in this uh, quite considerably. Okay. Um, now, the election of Hassan Rouhani, who was actually a former nu nuclear negotiator, and he's a re reformist candidate in 2013, uh, marked a really important shift in the dynamics inside Iran. Uh, Rouhani was a moderate, uh, much like, uh, un very much unlike Ahmadinejad, and he was very much interested in improving relations with the West. So uh, he reactivated the Omani channel and you started seeing talks in about August 2013 about a nuclear deal. Oh, okay. Now, right, and so this was immediately after his election. So let me so, ask a question there. Is it sir, actually the Iranians who really push for this or is it the Obama administration? It was both. Okay. Uh, the Iranians pushed because uh, just prior to his election, the Iranian economy collapsed. Uh, where you saw the value of its currency uh, skyrocket, sorry, not value, the inflation, uh, like, so the value on it uh, in ex terms of exchange rates skyrocketed. Yeah. And so yeah. people's life savings evaporated overnight, and there was a lot of pressure on the government to do something about this. Mm. And this convinced the government that negotiating with the Americans was the only way that we were going to get this, uh, these sanctions lifted. And that was ostensibly the basis for the nuclear deal. Iran okay. needed economic relief and right. wanted to be brought back into the international community, especially economically. And the Americans and the uh, P5 plus one essentially wanted Iran to give up its nuclear enrichment capability or at mm -hmm. least scale it back to a level that was uh, considered reasonable. So you started the fall of, uh, of 2013 seeing really intensive negotiations between the P5 plus one and Iran. Uh, now, this uh, culminated between in a meeting between Secretary of State John Kerry and Iran's Foreign Minister Mohammad uh, Javad Zarif on, April t uh, sorry, on September 26, 2013. And this was further followed by a historical phone call between President Obama and President Rouhani. Now, that was the first time that you had gotten direct high-level talks between the leaders of those two countries, yeah, right. um, which the, since Sign 1979. Significant so problem. very, very, very significant. Now on November 24th uh, of that same year, the P5 plus one and Iran announced that they had reached an interim agreement on the uh, nuclear program. Now this was originally called the JCPOA, sorry, the okay. JPOA, the Joint um, Plan of Action. Uh, and this led to a further round of negotiations that um, really kind of uh, tightened. Uh, they, they basically got into the nuts and bolts of the agreement to make sure. Right. I remember when this happened. Um, yeah. Actually, it was very technical I, in terms yeah, of the I, I, have a, I have a student who actually wrote a paper about culinary diplomacy and, re and referenced these negotiations that they weren't going that well. And they, then they ate a meal together, an Iranian meal. And... Actually, negotiations took off at that point. So it's an interesting aside. Well, and o over time, Kerry and Zarif developed actually quite a good rapport with each other. Now, yeah. Zarif speaks fluent English. He okay. is uh, he's Western educated. Uh, he has a PhD. Um, he's a very interesting character. Um, and at one point, schooled an American uh, congressman, no, an American senator on what the American Constitution actually says, which is quite <laughs> <Okay>. fascinating. <laughs> ah. So essentially, the terms of the agreement, uh, Iran ceased, uh, sorry, agreed to cease enriching its uranium uh, to reduce its stockpile of 20% enriched uranium uh, to basically nothing. They've gotten rid of it all. Yeah. Uh, at least they had gotten rid of it all. Right. Uh, to construct no new facilities uh, capable of an enrichment and to allow uh, extremely intrusive uh, International Atomic Energy Agency, um, the IAEA, uh, in, invest, investigations. Uh, right, if right. they wanted to see something, they get to see it. There's none yeah. of the Saddam Hussein taking them to the desert and be like, oh, it's not here. None of that's going on. Uh, 
So in return, the P5 plus one agreed to pause uh, its efforts to reduce Iran's oil sales, suspend select okay. US and EU sanctions on Iran's uh, oil exports, um, but also its access to precious metals, metals and yeah. uh, those targeting the auto and aviation markets. So Iran was having a lot of problems with planes that had been purchased under the Shah wow. okay. um, crashing. So a lot of people were dying. Oh. Um, and the U.S. agreed that it would implement no new sanctions against Iran and release uh, funds that had been held abroad from the sale of Iranian oil to, say, South Korea that had been allowed under the sanctions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what all those funds were put into a, a separate bank account that was okay. just okay. holding it. Now, that money turned out to be the like briefcases of uh, cash that were delivered to Iran that uh, President Trump likes to talk about. Oh. Um, it was never American money. Okay. Uh, it was Iranian money. It was always held by American banks. Okay. Now, over the next year, uh, Iran continued to meet its obligations under the agreement. And in April 2014, the IEA confirmed that it had diluted 75% of its 20% uh, enriched uranium stockpile, prompting the U.S. to release $450 million. Oh, okay. uh, by July, Iran had complied with its obligations to neutralize its stockpile entirely and had capped its stockpile of 5% enriched uranium and it was not installing any new centrifuges or anything like that. Uh, okay. Essentially, it was following the exact terms of the agreement and okay. was complying completely. Yeah. Yeah. And this led to the Security Council. Uh, uh, sorry, for the next 20 months, there were these technical negotiations were going on. And then they announced uh, in, July, on, in July 2015 the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which was the final nuclear deal between uh, okay. uh, the two sides. Okay, okay. Now, again, the terms of the deal are pretty similar to the uh, original plan, yeah. uh, but yeah. again, much more technical in nature, and uh, it's a long but, agreement to read, yeah. but this immediately led to- You're not going to uh, read the whole thing, are you? <laughs> I have. Um, <laughs> it's okay. It took uh, so, me a while, though. So we've, we've only got a few, uh, couple of seconds left here, Brian. So, uh, so, we've, so the deal is in place. And, and then mm -hmm. Trump, we, we know the rest of the story, right? Trump comes in and undoes the deal yes. uh, with the, 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 the Republicans and some Democrats yeah. who are pro-Israel were deeply opposed to the agreement. And yeah. in uh, May 2018, Trump walked away from the agreement, right. uh, which was, in my opinion, a, a big mistake because yes. the Iranians then utter stupidity. Uh, initially, Yes, uh, but the Iranians initially said that they were going to still abide by the terms of the agreement. Right. Interesting. Uh, which yeah. is was quite a positive uh, announcement. So, so it's possible. Uh, it's possible that we can recover this, right? It's possible that this could have a new life, but we'll see. I don't know. Okay. Because well, we're, we're going to have to wait just... with that for a, for another show, Brian. We are done. So thanks very much well, for, for being on History Lens, and we'll we'll get to this another time. All right. Take care. Okay. All right. Take care, Brian.